a great pleasure to welcome everyone to our Nudging Limitations launching event. Um, so today is the 12th of December and it's our first day of these uh, series of talk. Uh, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Insaf Ben Afman, and I'm here with co-host and co-organizer and friend Leila Zibar to spend the quality of time sharing with our presenters and guests experiences, knowledge, ideas about space development, limitation and practice within an utopian, dysutopian pluralism. I wanted to draw your attention that the webinar is recorded and streamed live on Facebook. And of course, I will go through a few technicalities before we start. Please feel free to use the Q&A section to ask your questions to our guest panelists. Kindly notice that the internet connection can be sometimes unsteady, so we count on your appreciated understanding in case of interruptions. So Leila and I are excited to start the Nudging Limitation Online Talks as the third Architecture for Change public symposium. We started Architecture for Change in 2014 at the margin of the discipline to become a collaborative platform for all. This platform is offering a series of workshops, seminars that aim to foster knowledge exchange and track innovation, different practices in the field of architecture and in particular architecture and development in the world. So, um, so nudging limitation. Nudging limitation uh, look to understand how different and mostly multi-layered limitations drive change to restructure the built environment and extend to rewire the societal behavior and influence policies. We look at how nudging old and new imagined fixities of limitations to special practices allow meaning to re-emerge within them. For our event today, uh, I'm happy to have with us Way Architecture Think Tank. So it's a planetary studio practicing by questioning the political, historical and material legacy and imperatives of architecture and urbanism through a panoramic and critical approach. Founded in Brussels during the financial crisis of 2008 by Puerto Rican architect, artist, curator, educator, author and a theorist, Ruth Garcia, and French architect, artist, curator, educator, author and poet, Nathalie Frokonski. Way is one of their several platforms of public engagement that include Beijing-based anti-profit art space Intelligentsia Gallery and the free and alternative education platform and trade school Loud Readers. So I'm happy to have you with us um, again. Uh, I'm looking forward for this session of narratives of failed optimism and uh, looking forward for the debate. Great. Thanks, the floor is yours. <laughs> so First, thank you very much. Yeah, we wanted to thank, uh, thank you for inviting us. And this has been like a great program. So we're very excited to be part of it. Yes, and I'm posting something here in a second. And now we can start. Uh, so thanks a lot for the invitation and uh, also for organizing the, like, the great talks that we, we had the chance to listen this morning for us. Uh, early in the morning. Um, so what we have prepared, uh, oh, I, cannot, I cannot share. Okay, now it should be fine. Can you see the full screen? Great. So we have this uh, like pretty much it's like it's a flood of images and we always try to avoid it, but there's no way to avoid it because it's, uh, it's too much in very little time. So we're gonna flip through a bunch of images and talk about a bit our condition. I think compared to, to some of the speakers we heard today, uh, we are very institutional in a way, in the way that we are trying to fight with the institutions for, for change, but also in creating many new institutions in, in that process. Um, uh, so it is divided in some, in some different parts. Uh, so the first part is about planetary displacement. It is not about refugees uh, and it's not about that type of displacement, but it's about using even ourselves as an example of what happens when you are forced to move around, when you're trying to practice or to have uh, you know, engage with the world. So we finished school, you know, in 2008, uh, at the same time of the, pretty, pretty much the same time as the financial crisis when Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy. And this 
uh, made a bunch of things evident that we are still seeing today, uh, in a way. The, the, uh, I moved to Belgium from Puerto Rico, uh, where, where, where Natalie and me met, uh, at the same time that there was a, like a new wave of populism in Europe. So Europe always had extreme right-wing parties, but in 2008, I, I could feel because of the financial crisis, there was a kind of a resurgence of it with people like Red Builders, you know, Marine Le Pen, and we know what happened in, with the Golden Dawn in Greece, with all the Troika problem, you know, in the rescue, the, the involvement of the central European banks and the German banks in the sort of, uh, in the bubbles that exploded in Ireland, in, um, in, in the so-called pigs, I like the Portugal, Ireland, Greece, and Spain. Um, and then we can see the relationship today with white supremacists here in Virginia, you know, or, you know, the American president, the disgraced president, and, uh, and the president of Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro, that have this sort of, uh, I think that there's some of the icons of this uh, really xenophobic, nationalist, uh, uh, not very intellectual, uh, anti-science uh, right-wing parties uh, that have taken power um, and have become really iconic and global too, right? Like, so, so there's some like a uh, global right-wing, right? So, so for all the uh, people that say that, you know, the era of uh, great narratives is gone and so on and so forth because neoliberal capital won, in, you know, what Francis Fukuyama uh, claimed some time ago, uh, we can say no, you know, like on one hand, we have like a uh, great narratives of right-wing assholes, and also we have uh, narratives of, of, you know, Black Lives Matter and like, you know, ecologists and, you know, like feminists all around the world. I think that that's also sort of planetary discourses. So where does architecture fits here for us is, a, is an important question, right? Uh, when we see people like uh, somebody that published a manifesto that says, yes, it's more, that it is kind of like a neoliberal uh, dog whistle or the people that are working with the, with the people that control our data we all always wonder what is the role, you know, these are some things that Bolsonaro has said recently, uh, you know, in the, in the recent years um, about, you know, the pity that these indigenous people are sitting on, on top of these resources, right? So it is not like this guys as a, as a, as a racist uh, bully, but actually you can find the quotes in the newspapers, right? So it, it is not like it's being hidden. It's like out there. Uh, and so when we see things like this, we should be, we should be worried in the design web pages when, um, you know, from the people, the founders of chattel slavery and, and, and colonialism, uh, they have a, a, a project to redesign Earth to stop climate change. I mean, you created climate change, so why would you want to, say, you know, get, get out of the way, I would say, you know. Um, and, and even the name that they put to it, Master Planet, to me, is like on one side really funny and in the other one really scary and disgusting. Uh, you know, the icons of this era when we see people like Elon Musk, uh, when he gets accused, you know, of, of uh, organizing a coup against Evo Morales to take the lithium there, he says, we will coup whoever we want, deal with it. And, you know, Tesla gets his lithium from Australia. Uh, but this really, like, within this humor, there's, a, there's, there's truth, right? Like, if they, they do a coup in Bolivia and they get the lithium there, he will be the first one to take it, right? Like, the, this is not, it is not, uh, um, it is not a mystery, right? That this is how it operates. So, colonialism is pretty much alive, right? Like uh, we, we can talk about the coloniality and you know, the post-imperial, but in a way not much has changed, right? Um, this is a map of our first 12 years of practice. Uh, and, and when we talk about displacement, this is how it looks like. This is a small way to map it, right? Like I'm Puerto Rican, met Natalie in Belgium, Natalie, uh, Natalie is French, moved to the Netherlands, had to move out because of like really racist uh, things happening at that time live in China for seven years, move back to the US to teach in mostly in architecture schools. Uh, so we went from a city of uh, 20 million people, you know, this is the last evening we were in Beijing um, in front of Guijie, the restaurant street where we used to live and then wake up in Wisconsin uh, in the middle of nowhere, but in the heart of American architectural ideology, right? Like the home of former uh, American architect, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, and all of a sudden we are confronted with this history uh, of, of that problematic figure of the white man architect that wants to solve the world, like the master planet, right? That we saw with, with the Ark Engels. And, and, um, and how, how, uh, how do we engage with these spaces, right? Like I said, you know, both of us would have mean nothing here, you know, back when he was there, like a black man from Puerto Rico and a, and a, and a French woman would have no space in this 
um, in these spaces, right? So how can we create new forms of architectural education that are kind of uh, working within those institutions, but making aware that they are really problematic and we need to find other ways to think about architecture. Um, so, you know, these are some of the things that um, we have done with our students and, you know, even our first class of students there, eventually they started making all these shelters in their thesis projects that were questioning the legacy, you know, that there's a masonry of, of actually, you know, kind of voluntary unpaid labor by the workers of Franklin, right? That were building all these buildings for free. Actually, they were paying to build these buildings. So it was like <laughs> some really strange servitude. Um, and students started questioning that and making projects that were not necessarily imitating Franklin, right? Or that I idea of the American genius or the male genius that's gonna change the world. And these are some of the projects they did, uh, you know, even picking up the trash from the from the, the washes around there to show, you know, what is the desert masonry today? Uh, uh, you know, and even having for us to deal with this, you know, we were in this documentary of BBC that says, frankly, right, the man who built America. There's so many things wrong about that, that sentence. The man that built America, you know, America as a country is even problematic, you know, not thinking of the whole continent, but also the, the, the fact that a man can build anything at all by itself in this scale is really problematic. Uh, and then, you know, as, just as we manage together with our students and the small faculty that was there to start changing the place, you know, it got closed, right? Like the foundation figured out that it was more profitable for them to sell soaps with the face of Frank Lloyd Wright and to actually question what does it mean to, to, to you know, play within this, uh, find a way to have critical uh, positions within this framework, right? And also like when we finished school, it was already the 40 year anniversary of the civil rights movement. So it was a kind of parallel time. And today it's not difficult to bring this, but some years ago we would talk about this and it would feel weird, right? Out of place because people would say like, hey, why would I care about this crisis, right? Like it has nothing to do with me, you know, like everything seems to be fine now, like we have made progress. And when we see that today, that's not the case, right? Um, and, and we can see all these events that happen, you know, that they're distant in the past in 68, but they're so similar to what's happening today all around the world, uh, right? Like even the icons that were so significant before are still really important today, you know, like in, in the case of Angela Davis, understanding the luxury for us to speak in this screen and not having to lecture with that screen, right? Like where it was so dangerous for, for, for black activists and indigenous activists to, to speak in public spaces that they had to have bulletproof glass, right? Um, so we had to also recognize that there's some sort of, uh, we're building on a legacy and we're taking advantage of it. So how can we use it, right? Like how can we work build on these icons that have sort of reclaimed the land, trying to question the idea of settler colonialism and have paid oftentimes with their lives, right? Like to be a public intellectual today for in some places, in some places it's really, really dangerous. In other ones, like we are kind of more protected. So how can we use it? Right, so we don't we don't run in the faith that uh, many people run right, like ending in prison for decades or being assassinated, right? Like the case of Fred Hampton uh, here in the Rainbow Coalition, one of the one of the member, like founding members of the Black Panther Party, you know, like Malcolm X or you know Patrice Lumumba, one of the the, the, the first president of the of the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, that got assassinated in a joint venture by the U.S. and Belgium. Uh, understanding today, you know, if these sort of resources of extraction have moved away from us, they still present, right? Like everything that we're using today, our computers, the technology to create all of this, it's been, it's been extracted somewhere, right? Like this is uh, one of those uh, mining uh, factories, uh, spaces in, in China, you know, where neighbors around here don't even know that this is there. The levels of radioactivity are super high and children will, born, will be born with, with the soft bones, you know, and the, and the formities, right? So there's a full um, sort of uh, system of oppression and extraction that is uh, really implicit in all these technologies that we're using, right? And understanding the role of workers in architecture, you know, this is the, the Gilles Noir in the, in, the, in the Pantheon as a sub-Saharan um, Africans, uh, workers with very little rights to a dignified life protested in, in, uh, in Paris, right, for, 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 for better rights. So understanding, you know, the legacy I come from the oldest colony in the world. Puerto Rico was invaded in the second trip of Christopher Columbus and has been a colony ever since. So what do we have to offer in the way that whatever happened in the colony and in the plantation back then, it is universalized today. So I feel like there's some intelligence embedded in these spaces that we're trying to explore and to expand, right? Uh, but Bonnie, you know, one of our pop, pop stars, trap singer, a rapper, 
he was already wearing the face shield and the, and the mask six months before COVID was even discovered. In the, in the first protest that saw a Puerto Rican governor being ousted for the first time. So in our first sort of mini revolution, uh, we, we look at this icon, like he was already announcing that something was coming, uh, right? And we, we had the chance to write about it also, like referencing to, for example, our uh, uh, trans poet, uh, Raquel Salas Rivera, where he writes this poem that for us is a manifesto of our time. And it really uh, helps us understand the politics of the US today, where he writes, hey gringo, if you love death, gringo is how we call Americans, right? Like gringo, um, hey gringo, if you love death so much, why don't you marry it, right? So for anybody trying to figure out what's happening in the US when it comes to COVID and all this, this is the, the best poem you can read. It is very short, very concise. And next to it, it has the 4,645 deaths of the Puerto Rican deaths of the Hurricane Maria, right? Of, people with name, without names, you know, but there were families and there were parents and children and wives and, and you know, and friends. And, and understanding that whatever is happening now in the world in COVID, it happened already in all these colonies, right? Like people have been dying meaninglessly for a long time, right? And, and anonymously in a way. Uh, understanding where, where is the battlefront, right? Like who are the icons today? In Puerto Rico, most of our protests are made by, uh, by the collective, uh, uh, feminist collective in construction. And this t-shirt also is a great manifesto that says anti-patriarchal, feminist, lesbian, trans, Caribbean, Latin American, right? So how to understand what is the role of, of uh, emancipating imaginaries and who's leading it, right? Like the, the role of, you know, here, Ricky Martin in the middle of those protests that ousted the governor with the rainbow flag or in Puerto Rico, uh, in, in Pittsburgh, where we were based until some months ago, uh, a young collective from high schoolers pretty much, right? Um, were really leading for like 17 or 18 consecutive Saturdays, the protests against the police, against police brutality, uh, teaching us how to reclaim the public spaces, right? Uh, and they were mostly queer, queer black students uh, of the collective Black John and Educated, um, right? Understanding again, all those images that are we seen today, how similar they are of 40 years ago. Like uh, I heard live the other day, a conversation with one of the members of the Black Panther Party, right? Uh, now saying like, it, 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 it's sad for him to see that not much has really changed if it comes to this, right? Uh, not only in the United States, but like you can go to Chile and see the protests, you can go to Puerto Rico and see the protests. Uh, and that endless question uh, that for, for us is quite obvious the answer, but some people still wondering, you know, if a building is more valuable than black or indigenous or, you know, or, or like sort of racialized life. Um, in the US, right, like the idea of Black Lives Matter is like, for some people, buildings matter more than Black lives, right? Uh, and that's also really problematic. Understanding who, who, who has been at the forefront of this struggle and who has been basically signing up with the, with the, with the evil forces, right? Like architects that will make in the web page, you know, design for prisons as saying that they design detention and correctional centers that facilitate the human treatment and rehabilitation of inmates. I mean, this just double think, like George Orwell would say. It is like pretending that you're doing something for society when you're actually oppressing, right? Like knowing that the, the legacy of prisons and, and police stations in the Americas is a direct, direct link, directly linked with the police, uh, as, as slave police, you know, and, and all these sort of um, institutions that are to perpetuate the land that has been stolen and take it and turn into private property. Right, understanding the role of the architect in, in all this and the designer in all this, right? Like making all these devices of oppression separate in separation as a, as a, and also in the destruction of the environment, the consumption and the, the endless sort of a thirst for more capital and progress and development, even the, the vocabularies that we use to describe these things. Understanding who has been at the center of the struggle, right? Who can, who, who is, who are the custodians of most of the, of, the, of the resources of the world, right? Like indigenous communities all around the world have been taking care of it, uh, but also they're being brutalized and murdered by, by, by police and paramilitary forces, right? Uh, in the US Standing Rock, it's a great example of this. Also understanding, you know, how architecture, popular architecture is not only made by, by you know, making camps and by sort of taking care of each other, but actually by uh, the, the really aggressive, straightforward, taking down of racist icons, right? Like, and this is also something that for me is like uh, super exciting because it is really popular made architecture, not by putting it up, but by bringing it down, right? When people come in together, uh, 
realizing that these symbols of racist colonial power can be brought down by the people, right? They were never put up by the people in a democratic way, but they can be brought down, right? Like not asking permission, but actually making it happen, right? And then after this, we've been working on, on some ideas about what the post-colonial means. So we, we have a quote from our post novice manifesto. The only purpose of education is to make new worlds collectively. This requires the practice of curiosity as a daily habit and the exercise of dignified and purposeful rebelliousness. Other worlds are possible. And, and this is like a project that is more academic, but that is uh, really important for us. And I think it has become really important for many people around the world where we start questioning the legacy of modern design and the schools that we go through, all of us, right? Like we kind of are indoctrinated and trained by, by these methodologies and systems, understanding you know, how the Bauhaus at the center of this, right? at the center of this sort of a modern education model uh, separated men and women, you know, women couldn't think in three dimensions, therefore they shouldn't be allowed to do architecture. This is still embedded in our culture today, right? Like the fact that we mostly see in the interior design women, right? Like, and the most of these studios globally are either run by men or are run by women that have been trained in the same way as men. So they're not really able to question the, the situation, right? And, and we try to offer other models that happen at the same time. For example, in the small Jewish town of Bitebsk in Belarus, Marsha Gal founded the People Art School where children and adults were making art and architecture together, um, right? And also the school was even administered in the 1920 by Vera Molayeva, right? Like it's not only that they were in the school, they were actually running the school. So, and, and we don't learn so much about these schools versus, you know, the other modernist projects, right? Uh, uh, and that's problematic, right? Uh, at the same time, in Puerto Rico, in the, where the factory workers, uh, uh, you know, and this is also something related, you know, and all of us know Turner, right, with the painting of the, the, the slaves being thrown overboard, and you can see the little hands and the beast eating them. What is really interesting about this painting is that the people that own the painting were an American family that sold it to the, to the Boston Museum, and, uh, and with the money, they bought a, a sugar plantation and a sort of a production uh, hacienda, you know, in Puerto Rico, Central Aguirre, uh, which is funny because uh, they buy the painting about oppression and then they go to oppress with the money that they sell out of this. Also, it's the institutional sort of exchange of capital versus what the real struggle is. Uh, and for us, this has been kind of interesting because it relates to a project that we've been doing uh, where we try to rescue another model of education instead of looking at the Bauhaus, right? In Puerto Rico, the tobacco workers, you know, in Cuba, in Dominican Republic, in Mexico, and in the United States, uh, tobacco workers who were denied a formal form of education. Uh, they would pick one, one among them that knew how to read, to read for them during the entire workday. At the beginning, they would read classics like Victor Hugo and stuff like that, and then they started reading Kropotkin and Marx and Engels and Bakunin, uh, and they started you know, uh, at the beginning it was mostly men who were reading, but a real central figure of this was Luisa Capetillo, who was arrested several times for wearing pants in public. So she was like hardcore feminist. She would write workers and feminist utopias in the utopias, the worker utopias that she will write about people robbing banks and then moving to the countryside and living, living happily ever after, right? There was no like subversive uh, uh, dystopian or whatever, right? Um, and she was one of these loud readers. She also had a, a restaurant in New York where she would read in the tobacco factories. And she had an apartment where she would rent rooms to workers and she would serve vegetarian, like ta apparently tasty and delicious vegetarian meals uh, for everybody, even if they didn't have money to pay, right? So uh, she was one of these lectores. And for us, she's like a central figure, uh, and, right? And, and as we think of other forms of knowledge that are not Eurocentric, right? We try to bring, you know, indigenous, uh, 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 thinkers from Bolivia or, you know, uh, African thinkers, you know, thinking about the post-colonial or, you know, even like activists within US or Mexico uh, or in the Caribbean uh, and question that legacy of, of, of Gropius, that's the genius, right, on the Bauhaus and, and question, you know, um, if there are right-wing spaces uh, in architecture, as we know they are, you know, like people like Patrick Schumacher or Leon Krier that, you know, either xenophobic or, or anti-Semitic or racist or all for the regulating the markets, right? Uh, and seeing the legacy of architecture schools in this complicity, you know, 
hear a quote from the chair of Harvard saying like, yes, this is really Eurocentric and we should remain that way, which is kind of sickening, you know, or like people making all these like, kind of basic and problematic quotes like that, 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 that drives diversity, not really, you know, uh, understanding that in Pittsburgh where we worked, uh, the university was producing predictive policing software that it was predicting that black people were going to commit crime, right? Like abusing them and gentrifying the neighborhoods. So how can we, uh, you know, understand that, that what's happening in the U.S. in academia, right? Where Leslie Loco had to resign pretty much because it's unworkable for many people. And I can tell you by experience, it is unworkable uh, most of the time. Uh, understanding the legacy of redlining, you know, in the U.S., but also all the sort of apartheid and segregation in the Americas, in Africa, in, 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 in Asia, even within Europe, understanding the role of complicity or like opportunism of designers doing monuments for black slaves and, 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 and oppression where they remove the word black in order for them to take the project or using instrumentalizing black bodies, right, for the profit and the applause of other white people. Uh, and even understanding, you know, publications that, that romanticize the idea of the genius, the, the, the architect as the genius that is going to save the world, right? Uh, and then we start wondering, you know, what happens when the right-wing space is not only the gas chamber or, or the concentration camp, but architecture school in itself, right? Spaces that have been run by white men mostly, right, where we were strictly forbidden from integrating, right, from allowing other discourses. And it still kind of remains like that all around the world, which is really problematic, right? Uh, understanding that this picture is not so strange. Um, and again, you can replace the people, but if they have been trained and indoctrinated within the same ideology, at the end, there's not much change, right? Like, so today, is, you can see how the CEOs of the, of the military, consultant and weapon distributors are mostly women, right? So, so it's almost like we, we can replace everybody and put people that look different, but we operate in the same way. And that's what this also produces too, right? So we need to question to the idea of basic representation as a real meaningful change, right? Understanding how this legacy of the Bauhaus can be translated as a really problematic thing, right? Where men and women are completely split between disciplines and, and forms of knowledge. So we propose as a recent project to do these sort of uh, new ways to understand education in architecture, uh, where we are trying to put anti-racism and ecological justice and anti-colonialism in the center, right? Not anymore, it's only about materials and so on. So we can question the knowledge we acquire. This is a part of the Manual of Anti-Racist Education. We pub publish freely online. It was downloaded like 10,000 times the first two weeks. So I think it has been, now we're working on the Spanish version. Hopefully we can have a French version. So I, I feel like it has a lot of the, of the things that we need to question within institutions. Uh, part of the map is looking at these maps that we have absorbed in architecture through history, where we look at styles, but the void of the politics around them and try to understand, you know, here, if we put anti-black systems all around the world, you can see how they have been central, you know, for more than a hundred years in the last, 120 years, right? Between Jim Crow, apartheid, and white Australia policy. This is just sickening, but we never talk about it. We can see when all the architecture and urban, urbanism organizations were created within them, right? So of course they're racist because they were fundamentally created in a period of, of, of segregation, of like active political segregation, right? Understanding the role of universities in the profiting from this. Uh, people like Philip Johnson that was in a Nazi, in a Hitler youth rally, the same year he founded the design and architecture department in the MoMA, in the Museum of Modern Art, uh, understanding, you know, who gets to uh, access to these institutions when they're so expensive, right? Uh, and we see, you know, here, this, we made these graphics where you can see the, 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 the endowments of these, some of these prestigious universities compared to the GDP of uh, some countries, right? like Libya, Democratic Congo, you know, uh, Bolivia, countries that have been actually uh, sort of abused by the U.S., you know, so there's a direct relationship between the abuse and the profit that they're making. Uh, and, and, you know, who gets to study architecture and dream about design in the future? That's also something we're really interested. Um, and, and out of this, uh, there's also an, some ideas that we're trying to propose to challenge that. So also, uh a theorist and philosopher that we really is really important in our work is Achille Bembe, and we really like the quote when he defines uh, the idea of decolonizing knowledge. Decolonizing the university starts with 
the deprivatization and rehabilitation of a public space. The rearrangement of spatial relations Fanon spoke so eloquently about in the first chapter of Les Danes de la Terre. It starts with a redefinition of what is public, what pertains to the realm of the common and as such does not belong to anyone in particular because it must be equally shared between equals. So there's a, a really interesting central topic that we've been working on. And, and as part of this, we've been working on an idea of what does it mean to create projects that are based on this? So following also uh, the idea uh, of a school of VTEPs where actually the first, one of the first collective was created that was called Unovis, where they were creating a lot of works without signing it individually. We started to create a collective called Post Novice, where we invite uh, a lot of different uh, people to join us uh, into creating a, a series of works that can take forms into like workshops, events, lectures, um, installation, art installation. And so that's, for example, like uh, some of the posters that we did for that. And uh, the idea also of being planetary is shared when we with the idea of being a collective because all of our members come from different parts of the world. We've been uh, looking at the problematic legacy that comes from the, you know, Alexander von Humboldt and his invitation of, of the West, you know, to discover the, the South and the, you know, and the, you know, the, the beyond what they know and to go and paint it and sort of redraw it. And we, we've been looking at all, all these kind of they appear naive or like peaceful paintings, but they're really aggressive in the way that they not only invite the discovery, the discovery, right, invasion, but also they erase the civilizations that live there, the nations that live in this landscape, right? So as part of this project, you know, this is a, one of the paintings called The Last of the Mohicans, right, where they are, it's a fictional sort of surrendering scene that is really embedded in the, in the imaginary of the, of the American empire. Right, and this is like the, the most iconic scene, right, where the uh, the American progress, right, the, the part of the manifest destiny manifesto, where you cannot see nothing more obvious than this, you know, the 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 white woman in the center with the book. It's a school book. It's not even a Bible, right? Like it's education, right? Uh, and all the technology that is coming, you know, the cities in the background are pushing all the indigenous people out into the security where they belong. All these primitive people, right? Uh, we've been reworking these ideas and we have been designing narratives that try to critique that and subvert it within architectural discourses. A series of exhibitions we may call the post-colonial room, you know, for example, one that we did in Nebraska, uh, where we try to reclaim these icons within the paintings to reveal the militaristic approach that they have, even if they don't show it firsthand. Um, trying to, to sort of reinsert them, you know, here is one of the, you know, the boosts of, uh, of one of the, the president that invaded Puerto Rico. Uh, um, and you can see many of these scenes. Uh, right now we're working on a play with members all around the world that is also working as a propaganda tool for people to join post novice and in this sort of the colonial take of, uh, uh, post-colonial take of, uh, of, uh, of architectural discourse. These are some of the scenes, right? Like, so we have members working within sculpture or filmmaking uh, or, or uh, farming or building. Um, uh, we were invited to do the, Summer, uh, the summer pavilion of the MoMA that we never really liked that project because we feel it's like a waste of resources. So we took the opportunity to say like, since we're never gonna win this, let's make at least a critique of New York in the sense that the, the reason why you have so many Puerto Ricans and so many tropical uh, subjects is because you know, of, of the colonization that is happening outside, of course. Uh, so we, we propose to bring the, the to, make, to make it more evident by putting all these tropical plants and making a summer garden with some uh, broken, uh, sculptures of, of uh, you know, colonize, colonizers and so on. Uh, we didn't win, of course, but at least we were happy with, <laughs> with what we did with the project. Uh, and these are some of the exhibitions of our post novice installations. Uh, the first one that we did in Nebraska. This is really important, not because it's just the post novice, but it did lead us to the next project uh, that is based on this. They started from this sort of working with other educators and with people working in literature or in political science. Uh, uh, you know, trying to understand the histories of a sort of radical feminism in the Americas, uh, being able to produce media with it, uh, reading all these manifestos, bringing some sort of new audience in, into these scenes, uh, making events based on that, and even using our, 
public lectures as uh, installations of post novice, right? Like where we are actually hand, hand, handing in the door before the lecture starts, posters for people to join post novice or after taking the stage and not presenting a lecture in itself, but a, rather a performance that is having this in mind. Um, and then it sort of leads us to a new project that started when COVID came to the US in March, more or less, when it kind of exploded for the first time, we were all sent online uh, and, and we figure out what can we do, you know, to question the role of the institution. So we made this sort of alternative trade school of architecture called Loud Readers based on the lectores of the tobacco factories uh, where, so it is a program that is still ongoing and it's gonna take many different formats like what Postnovis proposed. But initially at some point in the summer, we had 10 days with 35 speakers, with 25, uh, 25 speakers. Uh, from all around the world offering workshops and talks based on literature that they found was decolonizing or, or critical. Um, and, and, you know, people could subscribe online for free and all the files are still there. So you can go and access all the workshops that have been done. So it's kind of like a public education program, right? Like these are some of the, our loud readers and stuff has been there with us in some of the events. Um, we have people from all over the place, you know, from Africa, from Asia, from, from the Americas. Uh, um, uh, and you know everybody's kind of working to create sort of this sort of solidarity collective intelligence of architecture uh you know again you know reading kropotkin like like in the like in the factories or you know reading new things that are also really important uh again you can go to the loudreaders.com and find it there um and and you know these are some of the events you said Wolf joined us from from Cape Town, you know, to talk about the the, the textile factories, or Luis Otoni Rosa reading a factory in evolution, mutual aid by Kropotkin, or or a Traum Novelle joining from Belgium to to read us uh, Octavia Butler, the Parable of the Sower, or more more recently uh, Timur Sichin talking about his theory of indigenous materialism and and all his work uh, within the realm of art, but also as a as a Chinese, as a half Mongolian, half German. Uh, artist that was raised in American reserva uh, indigenous reservations. So I think it's a really interesting sort of forms of exchange, right? As part of these platforms, we also had the chance to, to publish, it's like a publishing house, online publishing house, where it allows us to put things out at a, at a different speed, more our speed, not the publishing house speed. Uh, and we published the Anti-Racist Architecture Manifesto in the summer, um, and we've been like, has been like covered online, you know, at, uh, in Spanish and in many other different media. We have been doing talks in Spanish and even had the opportunity to loud read in the streets of the, during the real, you know, Black Lives Matter protests in, uh, in Pittsburgh, um, you know, as, um, as we are kind of surrounded by the police and having all these people coming together, uh, understanding, you know, the role of, of this also, how can, can, it be, can it be brought to the studio in the architecture school? For example, these are some pictures of what happens in, uh, in Vieques. Uh, these are the effects, some of the effects of the military occupation of Puerto Rico, right? Like how they take the land, you know, and they use it however they want. The, the indexes of, of cancer in this is an island in the archipelago of Puerto Rico. They're super high, right? Like people are actually dying because of this. The, the Marine left, but they, of course, they didn't clean. Uh, um, and there's many other na naval bases around the island. And as part of that, in the part of our studio of Carnegie Mellon was based on that idea of reclaiming one of those military uh, bases. So actually, INSAF also um, joined us for the final crit. Uh, so I think you, you might remember some of the projects. But so we, we did this uh, studio called Hardcore Selectors and they're well making laboratories. And the idea was to reclaim, uh, as Cruz mentioned, this old uh, site in Puerto Rico that was a former military base. And then we ask every student to imagine themselves as being like a contemporary loud reader. And as such, what type of project would they have? Like if they have to build a laboratory and what, what kind of campus, public campus and public projects they could have uh, on this site. So I'd like some of the pictures uh, when we were in person. But what's interesting again with the topic is like all this happened before this summer and all the series of events that happened in US but of course, a lot of topics were already there. So for example, a, a project of Teller Latime, where she, she built a, a laboratory for the em emancipation uh, of blackness and black art, uh, and to have to hold conversation about that. Christoph uh, also built this kind of school for, uh, for protests. 
um, that also carries a lot of spirit of what happened during the summer. Oh, Crystal Shu question our relationship with, uh, with media and social media and the use of data and uh, all the technology of surveillance. Oh, Selena Zen, that question also the, the ethics behind fashion and fast fashion. Cassandra Ward with the question of like uh, land, land reparation and the importance of uh, the culture of food. Zishen that was uh, criticizing the American dream and all the ide ideology that is created behind. And that's like uh, to, shift, to jump a, uh, a bit with different kinds of projects that we do. We also uh, like to do a lot of workshops with different ty types of public. So for example, that's some workshops we did with children in Beijing, uh, in Dashla, but the children of communities that uh, sometimes they don't have access to this type of work. Um. Or oh, other type also of, of workshop uh, where we, we exchange ideas about architecture and about living in the city, where we try to use different mediums. So in this case, all the children were able to write stories uh, or create their own utopia. <laughs> Which is, uh, I mean, we didn't talk about utopia, but uh, he was already, he wrote utopia three times in the paper. So he was sure that he was making utopia, which is also really interesting. Uh, and also we create like a series of children's book also with the idea of engaging with different types of public. So that was the first one, uh, the story of a little girl in the sun. And that's also like different kinds of workshop again uh, with the idea of exchanging with children about architecture and how to make the city. So in this case, we had like, it was uh, in the form of a big installation where we had like foam cubes and we invited uh, all the children to think about, about a city that they wanted to create and think of different programs that can take place there. And what was interesting is like uh, all the work that took place, like the collective work. So you can see sometimes when the children were smaller, they had to collectively uh, work together to be able to carry the blocks, but also having like in different days, uh, like different uh, kind of exercise about the city and about uh, what does it mean to really think of a city where you all welcome but it becomes like really like a public space a place for togetherness and and then after that then the last two parts that we want to show are how can, how are we working with media to to engage with this right and understand the idea the ideas about form and how form is not a european invention right like uh, not not as a, we may uh may be uh, forced to believe, right? Like that formalism was invented by, by, by Europeans, but actually no, right? And we can see, you know, how in indigenous cultures all around the world, or even today, you know, with the Wipala flag in the Andes or, or the many other cultures, you know, from, from the farming beds of the uh, Pot Potowame people in, in Illinois to like, uh, you know, um, uh, African tribes uh, to the avant-garde groups or anarchist groups, right? Like working with this and how we have translated that into our own practice through exhibitions within institutions, but also to publications uh, that engage with these topics uh, and even installations in sometimes in museums, uh, which is now feels more institutional, right? Because they are like actually in the spaces of like uh, high culture or, or that are approved, but it, it is not always the case. And most of the times we are operating outside of it. We try to publish things that makes us reclaim the power of these symbols and to question their legacy within the imaginary of ideology uh, and try to see how we can sort of extract that and challenge it, right? Like, so it's not only the powerful that can control form, but also we can have some sort of forms by the people and for the people, right? Like this is the, the, the translation in Chinese, some of the exhibitions we did in, the, in some factories in Beijing, um, translation into German. And, you know, uh, this is a project that relates to it and it's really fundamental. We lost this competition to design the biggest museum in Russia, but we were one of the, of the 10 finalists. So we made this museum that should have been mostly open to the people for free, where people can access the art in the ground levels. We designed everything, then we went to Russia, then we came back heartbroken when we lost. Um, even if we got a nice fee and all that, we thought that it was the end. It's the only chance we ever gonna get to make something like this. Uh, so when we came back, we made this uh, project that was called the Palace of Fail Optimism, where you deposit all the projects that fail. So the building keeps spiraling upwards endlessly, right? Because there's always more projects that have failed. But in a, in a real way, 
we wanted to make whatever one of the museum was going to be in Russia, we wanted to make it in Beijing in a smaller scale because we were broke, right? Uh, and, and so what we found is that instead of going to the, uh, into the outskirts of Beijing where the most of the art, art galleries and commercial galleries are, we wanted to create something in the center of the city where the people could interact with it. So we created this, we, we rented a little room and we, we said like, we're going to make an exhibition. If it fails, then we turn it into our studio. So we made the first exhibition and then it became like a huge success. Uh, so it, all the media was writing about it. And then we started inviting artists from all around the world to, 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 to create. We were creating and inviting curators to make group shows from artists from Africa, the Americas, Europe, wh whatever, you know, whatever you can name, we would like search online and write to them and use our resources to reproduce the work, either to print it or show videos or find paintings or anything. Uh, and start making all these group shows that were discussing many different topics, you know, from uh, from displacement to uh, objectivity to queerness to uh, you know um, post uh, post uh, totalitarian regimes to representation. There was like installations of architecture uh, engaging with the idea of uh, digital media. Um, there were like many different exhibitions. We will also run programs with children of the neighborhood too, where they will come and learn about, this is great because uh, this is an exhibition about existentialism. So the children are writing about existentialism and the way to explain existentialism to children was really easy, right? Like it's like, so how do you feel when you're bored, right? And that was it, right? Like that was the best way to engage. Look at this video of somebody moving death from one side to the other and that's existentialism pretty much. Um, uh, so it was like through humor, you know, and like uh, at the beginning it was shocking, I think, for the neighbors. Then after the second exhibition, they were all on point, really, like with really contemporary discourses from all around the world. We were invited to do many more exhibitions in larger institutions, which we use. Uh, most, uh, it had a like anti-profit sort of model. So technically we, we could sell works, but the, the, the profit will go 100% to the artist. So we were more like facilitating and making things happen. Uh, even if we were like struggling economically, right? We had some people that were supporting the spaces uh, and we were doing exhibitions also out. We were invited by a developer to, to do a project for a, for a neighborhood. Uh, and there was this courtyard house that traditionally has been a single family home, but in history because of, you know, the hyper density and because of the sort of lack of resources, there were many families living here and they wanted us to make a second gallery there which we agreed with the condition that they had to build toilets in the units because they didn't and to provide kitchens. Uh, so we proposed to turn, we made an exhibition as an example, turn this into a gallery and a residency. Uh, so, so people can come here, but also we will improve with the money of the developer, the conditions of the people in the neighborhood. Um, and so this is the project we proposed. The developer didn't want to invest in neighbors because they didn't saw it profitable. So we declined the project at the end. Um, um, we were kind of betrayed by another architect that was kind of like uh, going after the developer. Maybe he wanted the project, uh, but we didn't want to compromise. It makes no sense to make a gallery if you cannot provide basic rights for everybody living there. That's a, an, another project we did when we were at, at the School of Architecture at Taliesin. So that's this project we did with our first year students. And we were approached by a common community in Miami. In a mining town in Arizona. In a small mining town in Arizona to, to work with like an existing building that was like this discarded uh, high school building and to turn it into like pr uh, affordable housing for professors because of course this teachers. teachers because this town was suffering because a lot of people were living because of a change of industry. So it was interesting. It was quite challenging for first year students, but so we had the opportunity to work a lot with the community there to understand also what was the need uh, for inserting programs that they could use too. Uh, so that's some of the workshop we did with, with high school uh, students too that were there. Uh, and also like having the opportunity to really understand as first year, you know, what does it mean to, to have a project based on an existing site and being able to taste, test it, sorry. So that's some of the, of the final images uh, of the project that the students did. So the idea was that the ground floor would become public. Uh, so a lot of, of those rooms could be used for the community to do workshop with children, uh, to have like class. Um, and so that's also like example of the units that were transformed. So every student had like a, 
like a, a, an idea of what we wanted to do. So, for example, also what does it mean to, to think of units that were really like accessible for everyone, right? Uh, and what does it mean also to, to design uh, for somebody else? Uh, another, so some around the school also the opportunity was like, uh, for example, to raise uh, the, where the parking lot was and to create like a basketball court, again, that was, uh, that could be used for everyone in Miami or also change at the back of the site, there was like a, 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 an old gymnasium that also was turned in this kind of really big event spaces. Uh, at the end of a project, we could present the project to the community again uh, in, a, in an exhibition that we actually made in the school. And it was really nice also to, to be able again to have, you know, first-hand comments uh, with the inhabitants of Miami. After that, I think the project um, might keep on um, because like he was cancelled, like a, a company uh, was interested in uh, keeping uh, the project going and making Making it. And the last project we're showing is a project that uh, we were doing in collaboration with a professor from the, the director of the International Business Program at the University of Nebraska and Lincoln. We were teaching years ago, uh, and he wanted to create a new model of education program for making a boarding school in Africa and in Nebraska, where there will be, he, he's actually from Nigeria originally, and he wanted to bring students from Africa to be in Nebraska, and students from Nebraska to be there and learn through farming and art. So we propose these units that can grow and shrink depending on the, you know, the side and the, and the, and the budget um, and, and have uh, these ateliers and multi-use spaces that always have access to a, to a, to a garden and a playground. Um, so the idea at the end this is the one of the project that we propose in Lincoln um, where you can see the bar in the left of those four units are the housing for the students and then everything else is the school and then um, all the rooms will always have access to, to like where you grow your food. Uh, so what, what was interesting in the project is that it came also with a, a critique of pedagogy and the idea was like really to center education uh, around agriculture, but also around art. So how to think also the building in terms of having the most flexible spaces to do so, but also the relationship to the land uh, that was really fundamental in this project. Thank you very much, uh, Natalie and Kuth. It was, uh, as usual, very uh, provocative, very um, also highlighting, you know, the major uh, challenges that we are facing today. Um, and especially we've talked a lot, I mean, about it. Um, what is really interesting is to see the way how you choose, actually, uh, to take action since 2008 to completely uh, shift towards uh, creating of something new. I think that you are still in the journey where you're actually using everything that is possible and in your, uh, you know, available in a way to create your own language to uncover uh, and the, the, the hidden things. And at the same time, you know, as you always said, is to to rewrite history or to kind of highlighting also, um, you know, the, um, the things that have not been, you know, um, under the spot because all the journey that you went through um, and I've always was from the beginning, I mean, there in a way uh, where you have been always trying to be more like a storyteller, but at the same time, very active in changing things uh, where it's very hard. It's, you are talking about education, architecture. Uh, it's about a mindset, which is very hard to see, to change and uh, linking it also to the, to the practice itself of architecture, because most of the people would think, um, and I'm, I'm not okay with you when you said that the presentation would be institutionalized, as I think it's completely the opposite, because uh, what I think it's about, how I can call it, there is a word that comes to my mind when Kruth was talking is about the dualities of imperfections. And the way of how we deconstruct and reconstruct is a whole process which is very hard to be. And I was really, really motivated, you know, by the speech because 
It's also, it's about story of ourselves, how we grow, how we developed our thinking, how we have to go through deconstructing everything we've learned by the way to accept that we have to share because we are all having common the fact that we traveled, that we felt in a certain way in our lives, um, in a way to cope, to try to coexist, to try to be in a certain way felt in the margin and trying to create things from scratch. And I think that this, what you were all related of it, it's how magnificent is the knowledge actually, the way to access education, to get to access this mass knowledge, to be able to share it, to be able to reflect on it based on our own experience, and at the same time to share it with the others in a very collective way. And I feel like it, it's in a certain way, you know, people today, um, things, uh, and I heard this quote, and I don't remember who said it, but he said that things are used, um, they, they, they used to mean something, you know, in the past. And today we are less in society. We're a society where we have been so much accustomed to listen, to accustomize to the way how we think, accustomize to the way how we feel at the same time, either for the poor, even for the oppressed, even for the one who has the power, even for the one we have been too much um, surrounded by these boundaries. In a way, it's so hard to, to, to understand or to be able to shift to that change. And I feel it's so you know what you've seen now, it's a, I love the way how it's without boundaries, because when you say we did it from scratch and without money, etc., I think it's one of the fundamentals. Because what we share also is the way to be having this freedom to not be under any certain way of oppression in a kind of way we always, you see this liquid when we're trying all the time to to oppress and then you flow to another room and then trying to go back, etc. This All of this is happening and uh, giving that to the students to understand that for us education is not about even universities and architecture is not has to be in the school of architecture it's something beyond that and it's something that logically should be um, a weapon uh, what i say or an instrument kind of to free people's mind um, and, and I feel like the way of how we also uh, customize ourselves to, to label people, to label people and to market on these differences. We, Russia this morning, she said something that is very interesting. She said, we build a whole business or a whole industry of exclusion and a whole industry, even when we're trying to solve things, we keep emphasizing on, this, on these disparities. And even everything became the cliche, either philosophy, even the way of thinking itself, and to be able to manipulate, because this is what you're doing, the core of you. You are using the production of all this knowledge, and you twist it, and you, you kind of also uncover it under, under different circumstances and contexts and putting them together because it's a way of bridging these thoughts. We are talking about this word where normally that's the pluralism kind of, because today it's about everything is there and we are mostly actually connecting the dots and trying also to say things as they are. Um, what is happening today that in our practice of architecture, we are part of the problem and we should acknowledge that. And we are, in a way, the way we write it, the way we re make the research, the way how we build, the way how we sustain this industry, which makes more people victims of the way how we shape the world. Um, thank you very much for that. And I think that um, you can, of course, we can, it's, it's an open debate, but we already, I leave the room for Leila because she's new. Um, it's, it's only I wanted to say about also the way how we have to shift the order of things and, um, and the way how negotiation could happen because confrontation today, it's not uh, inevitable. We can't, we can't have peace building without having at least using some soft power to be able to confront these ideologies. And I think it's time today just to say also stop because um, Related on my experience, it's always the fact that today almost it's uh, we don't we are not considered as architects because we are not into that uh, you know spectrum of it of the practice. We are so highly criticized, uh, basically um, 
uh, you know, kind of people think that we are, we are not supposed to be uh, like the Royal Institute or to have permission to, to practice architecture and so on. And, and I think that we also complete each other by the fact that uh, we want these series of talks to be able to say and to have this freedom to, to exchange our ideas. And also, I do believe myself that things could happen and things can change. And, I can, and I'm seeing them also happening every, day by day. Um, so Leila, for you. <laughs> uh, wow, uh, thank you very much, guys. That was uh, surely enlightening, I would say. Um, for me, it has been like very, uh, very interesting the way that you put things about education. Um, I mean, if you're talking about this personal journey of display, like being displaced, however, whether it's going by like moving from country to a country, but also you're moving between systems and these systems change how they perceive history and how they reproduce history. Everything is changed. I, I always tell my students and also my colleagues that guys, in Syria, we experienced the World War II differently. It was for us maybe a moment of liberation in comparison of moment of destruction for you. But then, you know, when you dwell in it, but you feel like, no, we're still somehow colonized. You know, our brains, we have the same school structures. In, in my school, in my public school, it was completely exactly the same as the Russian and the communist schools, which I saw in a museum later when I went to Prague. So they, we were wearing the same clothes, the same color, and we were sitting the same order. So somehow, you know, we, caught, we were caught up also in other parts of the world in this endless war uh, between different parties and different communities and different stories. And they all affected us somehow, our education, our understanding of knowledge as well. And then how do we voice out these kind of problems? You know, how do we remove and eradicate these things? I don't think it's about eradication. It's about what you have been always also interest, interestingly putting it differently as well, constructing by deconstructing. So we're kind of trying to build somehow, we're trying to acupuncture somehow, do acupuncture therapy for a lot of points and a lot of pressure points. Maybe I would say like the last COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter was really high pressure points where a lot of us could do more, especially being also online. Everybody was more present on the web. So there was a lot of voices being heard. Um, maybe I want to evoke a little bit and ask you a few questions. Um, so um, we're, I, in my perception, we're living in a cascade of crises where a little bit of normality comes, you know, it's not the other way around. We're not living in normal times. We're actually living in between crises most of the time. Some crises we turn blind eye on and some crises, you know, they're not really approximate, not really in our neighborhood, not really in our backyards. So how do you approach and talk to your students and also to your, let's say, larger audience about tackling these types of crises? Uh, how, how do you think also that we can voice out other, let's say, marginalized, unheard voices that cannot use English, at least at the same language? I mean, you've been translating to, I, I noticed Spanish and other languages, but what about other parts of the world? Yeah, I mean, this is a great question. And it's something that is, we really think about, right? Like, even when we made the loud readers, we know that, I mean, most people don't have internet, right? So, uh, and, and most people that know about us, they're mostly people that have been formally educated, right? In a university or in, or in a high school system and so on. So, I don't, I don't, first of all, I don't have the question. I don't have the answer for that. But um, we try to address it as much as we can in the sense that we know that we don't have the answers and, and, and we are suspicious, you know, the title of the lecture in a way, it is a bit what we're about. It is optimism that is always failing, but we're still not pessimists, right? We, we are, I think like that, at least my, I am not European in that way. I feel like Europeans are very pessimist in general, okay. like European knowledge, uh, like, Ex existentialism in Europe is very different than other forms of existentialism. Like, you know, Sartre, I cannot stand Sartre, right? Like it's a very, a very negative type of reading of the world. On the other hand, I feel like what the post-colonial world has to offer, you know, people that have been colonized and, and is that without romanticizing it, there's a different way to look at the world, right? Like may, it's not necessarily more positive, but 
maybe with more optimism because that's all you get at the end, right? Like if you don't have optimism in oppression, you're doomed, right? Like the, the last thing you lose is hope. Uh, and what we try to claim, you know, with all these questions, mostly addressed to institutions, right? Uh, and mostly addressed to people that may relate to institutions is that no, they shouldn't have the power, right? And we are giving it to them. On a way we give it to them allegorically and metaphorically and they have the real material power because they own land, right? And they, and they have wealth in their, in their bank account, bank accounts, right? So no, so if the, if the knowledge cannot come from there, where does it come from then, right? And who are the people that we should be listening to, right? And how can we use, you know, that's why for us, when we talk about formalism or media, you know, or installations, it is a manifestation of that. What, how can we reappropriate our means of production to talk about Marx again, right? Like to, to quote Marx, how can, we, how can we reclaim our means of production and use them to amplify the voices that have been left out or the narratives that have been left out? Because if only, you know, as we saw that picture of the architecture school, historical architecture school, the picture of Harvard University actually with Gropius in the middle, right? With all these white men around him, like what type of utopia does that produce? Yeah. Right? And, and that's pretty much our history. You know, our histories around the world have been utopias produced by a few, mm. a few powerful, right? And the powerful may change, you know, it's not white people in China, right? Yeah. That's real too, you know? Yeah, exactly. uh, we have to understand also that the struggles, they change the characters, but they remain the same, right? Uh, so how can we use these tools to expand our vocabulary, therefore generate other emancipatory imaginaries? And again, you know, when we make all the spiral and all these like maps in the manual and all that, so again, you know, it's online, everybody should be able to unload it and see it. It is not an answer, it's more like a proposal to bring all these points there and try to see what comes out of it. Because and you're creating uh, an archive. You're creating sorry, yeah, exactly. exactly. But, but not only an archive, it's a tool to question the archive, yes. right? Yes. Because, uh, because we are two people, and even if we, we, we collaborate with many other people, it's still very few limited, uh, you know, uh, you can say like Western, you know, because even if I come, I come from a 1500 year co colonized territory, right? We, we are Westernized completely, right? Like, even if we have like a really strong African culture, we cannot even talk about it because we don't know how to call it. We don't know the name for it, right? Like it is there in what we eat and how we, how we behave, how we dance, but we have no names for it. It is absent from our vocabulary. So, yeah, and, and what I said is the same that even for our practice, because once I was talking with, the, you know, with the journalist once, and she was just in curious about what you do, even for the work. And I was talking about that we have, we are many, and she said it's like an organized chaos. It's actually yeah. you can't label it. You can't put your yeah. name and your novel. No, exactly. You see, and we don't have we don't have the names for it because we are limited by our education system, by our whatever, right? So, how, if it's possible? How can we either blow up these institutions, you know, open, open them up or make other ones where people, these people that have been left out can generate those imaginaries because we need them. You know, I, I actually don't know how to solve anything. You know, I'm useless. If you drop me in the forest, I die in 20 minutes, you know, okay. uh, and I feel like we, and that's in the small, you know, funny way, but in the larger way, the larger questions of life, you know, where they, we're destroying the planet and all that, I have no answers for it. All I can do is make collages, you know, or like write books. I think that those things are not really going to save us. They are very right? powerful as well, because you see what you're saying, what I meant about the archive, because today the new generation, actually, when they come back to what you're saying and the means that you are using, for them, it's a way also another version of stories is at least because in the past, we, this is what happened for us, for instance, the language died. We are so hard. We tried like for years now, we try to dig deep to see what is happening in either in the Arab regions or our history written by ourselves. And even the fact that those who have been, uh, you know, have been taken away. So we can't even access that knowledge. We can't access, we're trying to piece by piece to rebuild, you know, the past. And at the same time, I feel like the way how, that's why it's part of very important your presentation today, because we are aiming actually to translate it even to Arabic and so on to reach more you know, the audience and other languages. Um, I know that we can't do anything, but 
for my belief, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a pure optimist, actually. And I feel that the optimism, it's not only about pure optimism, but it's about the cycle of success and failure in itself. It's about the way, because failing in itself, it's a, for me, it's a kind of success because we are deconstructing in that phase. And then when there is this optimism, there is a way of results of construction. And I feel like architecture for years and years, since its beginning, it was always a manifestation of power. And it is, yeah. uh, it's, it's really powerful. And people when think, I think it's basically, you don't have to question, you just have to make equal. Because architecture is power, whatever power is used then to empower whom, then the majority or the minority. And this is which should accept at a certain moment that there is a certain, that's why the word order. When yeah. you combine order with justice is not enough, but order with justice and ethics, and a, and a kind of collective ethics, because what we were always saying, some people doesn't mind. They said, it's very natural. See the planet, how we live. There is always the, what we all the time listen about it is the power of the jungle, or the, let's say the power of the white have to be always maybe dominant. This, this is always, you have a dominant and somebody who is dominated. It's people accept actually, and they try to explain this as an ethic. And this is what we should work on it, is to saying that, you know, the way how we think should change, the way how we exist. And maybe the fact that we need to survive and the survival, it's not only about suppressing or deleting a half part of the world, but it's about trying to find a balance of how we live all. It's that what you said at the beginning, it's a new alternatives, that there are other solutions that could be found. And I feel that our part in this is also to look because these things are happening on the ground when we see in the way of either in camps, either in the poor areas. And it's really fascinating because where people doesn't have nothing is where actually everything is built again. And we have this process. So I think it's like a curve and a kind of something that we should not reach out. And we need some kind of regulators towards that to keep the things, the curve always low um, in that sense. And we feel all the time we go back just even I know we took the time and from you, it's just that architecture being powerful, us, it induced that we have a responsibility. And each of us has to be also, there is a responsibility. And as these, all these architects and so on have to be accountable of what they are doing at a certain level. I feel today we're talking about these things and I think that architecture is a form of racism as well, is a form, a form of yeah. injustice. It's a practiced as such, educated no as such. There's no settler colonialism without architecture, right? And there's a, in, in the Black Lives Matter, it's pretty much an architectural movement. You know, it's like abolish the prisons and the police. Those are buildings too, right? Like the prisons are buildings. So that, that's all. Planning, planning is military. Planning, it has been the essence of planning. It's military people who actually put the basis of it. So we need yeah. just to think about that we can't stay in the same framework and try to change it. That's not possible. Maybe I will, yeah, maybe I will provoke you again, Natalia and Cruz, for the, what you said about right-wing spaces. It was for me a very, very interesting term. And um, we are all imprisoned by, you know, worlds and promises as well. You know, people say words and architects use words to describe their projects and they imprison somehow people's imaginations about that. I mean, for me, I would say, for the time being, writing spaces are becoming more territories, borders, and also camps. And, and uh, I don't know, occupation movements being people being evicted, everything is becoming actually right wing spaces somehow. So, um, from your experience and also from your observations and uh, from your talks around the world, how do you think that these right wing spaces um, get their power over people and also over minds? I mean, the problem is like, it's what we were saying before, is like all this uh, become, is part of a system that has been there forever, right? That is of course linked to the, to imperialism. And the fact that the system and the, is so, you know, strong in a way, but it carries a lot of different discourses. So it's not just architecture could be, is a form of this discourse is also like, more so because it becomes like a physical manifestation of those discourses. So the impact, you know, is really real. And 
when we see the politics today, unfortunately, not, you know, not a lot has changed, right? And I think when we think of architecture, architecture still operates the way it has since many years. And the, the kind of uh, politic entity of architecture as being, again, like this manifestation of this ideology is never really questioned. So it's easy for it to still be really operating in that way. And I think we see it, and of course, being linked to, to all the, the political powers that we have nowadays that are very, you know, neoliberal. Of course, all, all these spaces, unfortunately, you know, uh, becomes more and, and more present. They will have more funding. They become ac accepted, right? Because it's also part of the main discourse of the neo neoliberal discourse of today. So the same when Cruz, you know, was showing at some point of a lecture like this, this just when, I don't know if you noticed the language that was offices used to speak about, you know, uh, dignified for human rights. Are, are we speaking of prison in a, in a system like the American <laughs> systems of prisons? You know, it's just, it's, it's really scary in a way because, and again, I think it goes in a lot of points that we always discuss is, is the idea that the architecture becomes so detached from everything, right? But, but in the name of its detachment, you cannot really question it. Uh, you can't really question its ethic, right? Because it becomes like a service or a service for society, but which yeah. society, right? And I think it's uh, like, as we see today, the problem is like, and also the link with, uh, with, with business and corporation, like uh, the risk is like architecture becomes a lot of corporation. And it's such the only question that is asked is about a monetary exchange, right? How much you're going to have when you do this project, you know? And and it's it's really scary, but I think yeah, I don't I don't know if you, if you have something to and, add. And then you know, like if, if in a more general term, it comes more. What what does it mean the status quo? You know, and, and I'm gonna use this really simple example that is not architecture related, just to see how embedded it is, because I keep on you know I'm hearing you, but I use it a lot to, you know, when we say right, mm -hmm. as the right is the correct right like you say it's a it's a that you can exchange them you know and knowing the the history <laughs> you know in architecture school when we were forced to draw um uh, by hand you know some people still do it uh, that they force the students to draw by hand and they will punish them when the drawings are dirty you know i draw with my left hand right the left is always evil you know in the, in the construction <laughs> of the west you know? not only the west i think in the other cultures too right this idea of the left being evil is really embedded in everything we do right the right is correct. The right is the status quo. And, and that's in the general sense, right? Like in a funny way, I'm trying to be like funny. Yeah. But then also if we look at it in the political realm, right? The full economic system that, the, that, is, that is running the world, right? Like even, you know, a, a state run economy like in China is still capitalist, right? Uh, the neoliberal system of economy that is sort of enhanced by, by these technologies of, uh, of, uh, of mass communication, digital mass communication, is a direct descendant from the primitive economy that was formed out of the, uh, out of the transatlantic slave trade, right? Yeah. So It's very interesting what you're saying. I'm, I'm just thinking about it now and also about what Natalie was saying and about, you know, we provide structures for people to live in, but somehow we always attach the value. But whose value is that? You know, we provide you dignity. Yes, yes. And, and also like, uh, and this is something that Achille Bembe talks about is that when we look at it in the full picture, and this, I'm mixing Achille Bembe with, uh, with our friend Luis Otoniel Rosa, right? One of the, one of the members of, the, of, of Postnovis. Um, Achille Bembe asks, who owns the earth? Right, that's the first question. And then what do we do with the people that don't have a claim to it? That's the, that's the second question, right? Like, I think like all the presentations today relate to the people that don't have a claim to it, right? Like not, the, not with the people that own the world. Then the other question is that, the, that uh, Luis uh, addresses when he's presenting Kropotkin, you know, mutual aid, you know, a factor in evolution is the question of how absurd it is for somebody to private property, yeah. for example. Like, if you don't own the earth, how can you have a claim to it? Say, like, this is mine forever, you know? Mm -hmm. The earth was there before you, and it doesn't give a damn that you're there, probably, and the, and the earth is going to be there once you're gone, too, you know? The, the whole idea of value that we give, you know, and, and to give you another example, that this is from another text that we use in the manual of uh, anti-racist architecture education. It's, uh, there's this, this text that is an academic text, 
that is very popular, at least in the US, that is called The Colonization is Not a Metaphor by uh, Yves Tuck and, and K. Wayne Yang. Uh, and, and one of the topics they use there, one of the descriptions they use is the idea of Occupy, for example. Occupy went to Wall Street and say, no, we want the 99% to be wealthier, to be richer, right? Uh, and what they're claiming is, if you're really about the colonization, you won't try to make the 99% richer. You will try to make the 99% poorer, right? Because the idea of value and wealth is used in that capitalist model. And, and they give you the example of Haiti. You know, Haiti was one of the wealthiest, the, the wealthiest colony of the French empire, right? Uh, and, and at the moment that they became the first uh, uh, successful slave revolution in form a legitimate form of government, government right, like an independent government, uh, it, it is still the, one of the poorest countries in the, uni, uh, in, the, in the hemisphere, right? Why? Because what gave them value was, the, was people as property. Right? It, was a sugar, it was sugar that was owned by France and people that were the property exactly. of France. At the moment that this, this is subverted, the value disappears. Mm -hmm. right? Therefore, it's poor. Right? Because what was commodified was that extraction right? and that possession of people. So mm -hmm. then we're using the rubric wrong. Like, what measurements are we using for value mm -hmm. is totally questionable. Right? So if we have that in mind, how do we operate as architects? What imaginaries exist? And again, you know, my imagination is quite limited. And I think like most of us have very limited imagination. I'm sure there are other forms of living and other forms of existing, right? And I'm not talking about the dialectic between, you know, because I feel like also the camps are a problem because the camps are the result yes. of that sort of displacement of certain colonialism and so on. What are, I'm not looking at, the, at that yin and yang, right? I'm looking at something else outside of that. What is outside of that sort of bubble of neoliberal capital mm -hmm. that can allow us to have a dignified life, yes. solidary life, but also that makes sense, you know, with the, with the ecology and the planet and the non-human species, right? Yeah. And there's many theories about this, you know, there's indigenous materialism, there is like flat ontologies, there are other forms of living, right? Uh, it's still all of them somehow relate to capitalism because capitalism is always there looming in the background, right? Like if you're sitting over resources, somebody wants to blow you away to take those things, right? Or Even they want Harvey. to- Yeah, Harvey, he said the same. He said, it's, yeah. you can't think outside the bubble of colonialism because it's culture. Exactly, yeah, but, 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 they're, they're, but they are, I feel like there are other imaginaries. Exactly. We just need to provide exactly. space uh, or like demolish ourselves in order to allow them to exist, right? Exactly, like yes. to become to the center, right? Like yeah. not in the periphery. I think as, as soon as, as as soon as we imagine peripheral knowledge as peripheral or as non-center, then then we are like satisfying, you know, the discourse, right? That's why I I, I almost try to avoid every text that we talk about that has the global south or the west embedded. Is that because the editor put that there? It will never come from us, right? Like, uh, also we live in China, so the idea of the East and West and all this stuff, well, for me, doesn't make sense, right? Uh, because it's still the, the construction of this central of power looking at the world around it, right? But from what, that perspective, from that, that it's, perspective it's, it's, right? It's like, very unique. Flat perspective. Very, very flat, unique. right? And very hierarchical. So and if you just like think about it as a, as a globe, like as, as a circle, it could yeah. be the East and the West. Yeah. Or, or, or north and south, right? Like, but not even that, like if we see how meaningless we are in the, in the universal scale, right? Uh, I wouldn't even bother, you know, that we're not in the center or anything, right? Because uh, at the end, that's what it is. We're just a bunch of accidents living in this space together. So how can we, having that in, in mind, how can we, more, we, we be more solidary and imagine other ways to imagine the world, right? Like what, what have tools a shared do we need? authorship as well. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or no authorship. Yeah. <laughs> like, no authorship yeah. The same is like basically yeah. that if it's shared, it's completely, you know, so, so, contain itself. It's exactly. So so how do we question all these sort of uh, vehicles? That's why speaking of limitation for us is very important, and I, you know, it's it's also part of his theories, right? But I think it, it drove a lot of everything that we did because we, yeah. as Chris mentioned, but without romanticizing, without romanticizing it. But it's really like I don't a, want to be limited. It's not. <laughs> Not 
but because it's like it's kind of an acknowledgement of ourselves yeah. right and and the belief in the collective and collective knowledge and i think in Saf, you you talked about it at the beginning is for us this collective knowledge exists right it's just trying and yeah. it's by the hope is by you know bringing us us all of us together that we can well not all of us i don't want right wingers i don't okay. want white nationalists <laughs> so that, that's the other thing too i don't want all of us i know today. i know i'm not trying I to appeal yeah. i'm not trying to appeal to these people i fight with them every day right like yes. so there's a i feel like we don't need everybody in the, in, the, in this sort of new worlds we just need to get rid of the right. disgustingness of we need the and that's that the dangerous right. part right the ones that we yeah. need. Also, another thing that I wanted to say is that, yes, we managed to do all these things that look interesting and funny and beautiful sometimes or less beautiful some other times. Um, it is not ideal, right? Like, I think it's really precarious. I think we were, we are mostly, well, now less than before, but we were really in a really precarious situation where you're making all this work, but you're almost like if you, if you make a misstep, one more misstep, you're done, right? Like literally exactly. stranded with no visa and no money. So I, I don't want to romanticize also the sort of precarity of generating work under these circumstances because uh, it was never easy. A lot of the things were really heartbreaking and most of the projects come because, because I, in a real way, at least me, I am kind of useless, you know, like, like when I was in Europe and I didn't want to work for racist architects, I couldn't work in Burger King because I don't speak any language of the countries where I was living. So all I can do is architecture in a way. So that uselessness prevented me from doing other stuff. But if I'm in, maybe I'm in my, if I'm in my country and everything is going bad, you know, I end up working somewhere else, right? So I think like to be real, since we're talking about the limitations and all that, it is nice when you see it now in retrospective and it makes sense because we're giving a lecture and we can organize everything. All right? of us in the same. To, to make, exactly. But, but also to be real, it is, I, don't, I don't think we are, it is, it is problematic that we have to do this in a way. Right? Like it is really difficult and it's really, it's really risky. Um, and I feel like whatever systems we have here, even if we're trying to work with the universities and all that, I don't have much hope that they're gonna change. Uh, but I feel like some people within them can be exciting for a short amount of time. And your students you, as well will be one can, of them yeah. will, will definitely. They can, you know. but like, for example, I have very few black students, mm. right? Because I, I, as we show in the, in the graphs, right? Like most people have not even access, you know, the median household income is so below the education price, especially mm -hmm. in the U.S. that yes, it's nice that we can think together. We are so far beyond because uh, even the people that we want to talk to, they're not even there in the space. You know what yes. I mean? Yes. So it is, even if it's something happening, you know, like if I'm doing this in a private school, it's not doing the purpose for exactly. sure. Yes. Like, yeah. like the fact that we did the thing in Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh, it's a nice project and the students are great and I'm happy that we were there, but it is not the goal, right? Like, and it's so far from the goal. That, and that's the part that uh, keeps me awake at night, right? Yeah. That is like, Yes, we're doing all this work, but we are so far from, from where... When I taught in, in private, actually, university, I, had, I felt the imperative that I have to teach in a community center for free, because this is <laughs> because so... And, and actually, no, because what you're saying is actually, I feel also, if we put it in a context, um, people maybe don't know, but I'm very obsessed about limits. Uh, since <laughs> Natalie, she was there at the university, my thesis actually was about limits. And actually, I said, what I conclude, limits are there to be crossed. And the way that basically, all what motivates me, actually, every time the way how we live, people think that we are coming from a very nice context, etc. But we have very difficult choices to take in terms of sometimes we are broke. Sometimes we have to do to find solutions. Sometimes we are kicked out from places because we don't fit and and all of this I feel in a certain way made us who we are and made us in a way persisting on the fact to cross these borders because as you said it's you know like uh, we have so much in common I think the stories that like if you go back to once when I was uh, uh, invited for the loud readers I said that basically to be able to tell stories and I imagine if each person in this world we can name the person and tell that story etc we will find out how many a lot we have in common and how much empowerment we could have the energy that we share today in this you know talk 
it gives us for each of us a lot of bunch of energy to continue further because we feel that in each around the world, and this is, I couldn't feel it be, be, before. I lived in a, in a, in a place, my, my father himself was at a certain moment because he was part of the military and so on, I couldn't have the right to say a word or to say no. And I lived in this oppression part where you for almost more than 20 years, you have to all the time be quiet because you're afraid for the people that you love. And also at the same time, being also a mythist, your father is black, your mother is white, you're a North African, you are, a mo you are also a woman and you are also an Arab. And being in architecture school when you are not considered part of the architecture because I was there and I, the first thing that I heard, you will never be an architect, you're not part of this tribe or kind of. And I, when I reflect about it, I spend a lot of years of trying to completely disconnect myself from the way how I think. And I end up realizing that all what I have as a result, it's a result of who I am actually. And maybe that all these unfortunate failures and rejections and the way that the people doesn't hear you, listen to you and experience traveling from a country to a country, even the problem not having a visa, being obliged to go back, etc., and leaving all these. I mean, it's only what I always say, we can read things, we can see the knowledge, but we only through experience and sharing it, we will be able to understand it. And when we reach that level of understanding the depth of these words, we then connection is happening. And I feel that it's giving an infinite energy to continue and to, it's like a leg. For me, I wanted architecture is a leg of knowledge. It's a process where we basically continuous process of giving that by sharing experiences, by, by telling the truth. And I feel like even though in philosophy and other people said that it's very hard to define right and wrong and ethic and not, but I feel like today everything is kind of quite clear. I feel that there are things that they are so obvious, very clear, and uh, non, no to violence, no to exclusion, no to property, as you said, that it's a private public. We are nomads and being able to, in a simple way, make people experience it it's a huge deal. We are really making things again. And the limits and limitations, we got a lot of discussion with uh, Leila about it. And I go for limitations, but I feel like limits because I go to architecture. The first thing we do is drawing. Actually, we design spaces by keeping them continuous. And the fact that we draw the line in itself as a line and as a human being, we are in ourselves uh, a skin, a boundary, a limit and this is how things are processed so yeah so, so <laughs> it's wow. you can I go mean, forever <laughs> <of thoughts>. I <laughs> mean, yeah i mean for me it just sounds uh, like how we are products actually we are really products of our limitations and i think you know we have the power to write to be part of our own stories we are the protagonists after all and we can you know allow people to dictate us how to live our stories or try to somehow nudge what we call it, nudge these limitations. Uh, I think what you have been doing is so great. You are also telling people that there is a possibility even to make a small dent in this huge, you know, unperceptive world sometimes. Huge you know, work, amazing work, amazing effort. I mean, 12 years of... I mean, I have a list of questions, but I would just... <laughs> <laughs> we have loads of them. <laughs> but uh, I, I wish, you know, we always talk like, because when I knew uh, Kruth and, and Natalie, of course, we always, even in Egypt, because Leila, she was one, at the beginning, I knew Leila as one of the volunteers in one of the workshops, and then she became, you know, after that working with us, and today she's an associate, part of the collective of Ecumen, and she's also, you know, the fact that it's, I, I seeing all this dynamic, we always wanted to do something. And I hope that in the future we'll be able to bring all these things and make a huge bubble in the MENA region. Like um, in terms of saying, what, what are you saying? <laughs> what are you talking about? Um, yeah, I mean, we were shaped by this kind of like, I'm Kurd, I am Syrian, I moved to Egypt, I am a woman. It was like a lot, a lot of things, you know? But I think like we, you know, I find my way through because of these limitations. I think like challenging these limitations created somehow, you know, this space for all of these people to come around. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I think we're blessed somehow with our limitations more than we're blessed. Yeah, but also, but I, I think like to be real also, it's like we're blessed, but also we are privileged too, because I, yeah. within our own, you know, backgrounds, many people don't even have the chance to even think about this. 
Mm -hmm. you know, That's why it's good to empower uh, Cruz. It's yeah. good to empower so others. I'm also, I'm also aware to, you know, as in your case mm -hmm. too, like, and, and of course, you know, it is not a competition to see who's more, more messed up. Yes, but I can imagine that being a woman, you know, a Kurdish woman, you know, in, in, in Syria, perhaps it was much more difficult, for example, than me being, you know, a boy in a, in a, in a macho country, right? So, but uh, what I mean is that, yes, you know, somehow we're here discussing this, but there's many people like us, you know, when we were younger that don't even, even don't even, cannot even have the luxury to think about this as a possibility. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's what I mean, how far we are when we're thinking that we need to render these new worlds and we need to work together, you know, not those guys, but us, you know, work together to make, to make possi these new possibilities. Create possibilities, yeah, exactly. And there is such a, such a big uh, change that has to happen, you know, and, and of course we all know this, that it needs to happen in, in different scales for this to even be considered a possibility, right? So, so that's also why, why we always also try to keep an eye on, on, you know, on architecture, but never as a bubble, right? As you also doing, right? Like, uh, and, and maybe in this, in this way, that's what I mean that I'm maybe more institutional because I still think of architecture as a, as a you know, I, I believe on, I, I, it's not that I discard other forms as non-architecture, is that I also believe in the architect as a designer that goes, you know, and takes decisions. And I, I, in a weird way, I also believe in planning and in urbanism as something that can bring positive, you know, imagine that you put all that effort on making segregation to make things that are for the people, you know, I would be really interested to see that happening, you know, uh, I don't know if it's possible within our framework, but I, I believe there's the capacity to do it and the mechanisms to do it in this sort of, um, you know, or urban, you know, sort of, uh, sort of um, uh, yeah. approach. Uh, but the political question at large, right, of real politic, you know, of, of the of the real, you know, struggles and all that, it is always central, anyways, right? Uh, and architecture is always a, a vehicle and a tool, uh, but but also there is the other outside of it. I mean, maybe occupied within it, but outside of it as a, as the discipline, right? So so that's also something that is. It's quite interesting. And, and maybe that's where the question always like, yes, we are here and we're lucky, you know, and, and of course, you know, we're shaped by, by our circumstances. But if somebody gives me a choice, uh, and I feel like many people like, it's like, can, would you be happy if you can make it here without going through all the suffering and all the oppression? Yeah. Yeah, I'll take it. Right. Oh, not, I know. <laughs> <laughs> right? so, so there is this, yes, we are shaped by it, but I wish we weren't. Yeah. Uh, so that, that, that's what I wanted to say at the end, you know, like, I wish we, we didn't have to be shaped. Like and this is the right? utopia, actually, you're in the core of saying what could be happening in like a normal life. And this is a, you know, um, I always felt like it, I couldn't believe in it after I lived in Egypt for the five years of what I've seen. And it took me a lot of time to just realize even even until today, you know, it is, I feel like not worrying or not being in such as like a luxury or a kind of I couldn't afford it. I can't, I can't allow myself of, as a form of solidarity because actually I feel like uh, getting to live and to see all of that because I felt in a certain way also privilege, knowledge is privilege as well. And to be able to today have a talk and talking and having internet and working and making these things. It's, it's a, that's why I felt like in a way, I think it's all could coexist actually, but we need at least the 90%, as you said, of, of being, you know, this is, could be for everyone, a right of it. And maybe we can allow a 10% of, uh, you know, unfortunate. And this is what basically the goal um, and our objectives. So thank you very much. I took a lot of time uh, as usual, and it was really, really nice. Uh, thank you very much for this um, insightful presentation. I just I wanted just to present for you quickly for tomorrow. If you also have the time, it will be great because we will have Tarek Nassar, who is really, really an amazing, uh, you know, person. And he's an architect um, and his background, but he has also a master in urban planning and he works in the East Jerusalem. Uh, he's a Palestinian and he's working with the community and he's trying also to nudge limitations 
uh, within that context. And I feel it's very interesting to see. We will have also Renette from the Netherlands. She's been 20 years working with children and about how to give their rights for people to, and children in specific, to shape the city and the spaces. And of course, we have Dr. Basant Masood down of materials, a deep investigation to capture the intellectual power of materials, especially in Egypt, because something is very, very uh, crucial there. And Leila Zibar, dwelling and homing in refugeehood. That's her uh, PhD working since years now. Uh, so we'll have the, the chance to have her. Thank you very much. Thank Hope you very much. You have oh have a lovely guys. day, evening. <laughs> Yeah, it was a pleasure to meet you. Yes. Uh, yeah, very nice. Hope we can keep uh, the discussion going. In we sure will. <laughs> a lot, a lot to discuss. I feel. Yes, we do. Yes. That was great. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Thank it you. Was great. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye bye.